All right, warm up. Well to you from Geneva, Switzerland. I'm Reda Satki from the Geneva Learning Foundation. If you're just joining us now, a warm welcome to you. This is going to be an information briefing. It will be probably the only time that uh, we are presenting a lot of information. And the reason we do this is if you are an applicant or potential applicant, it is so that you can... Um, you can make the decision, do you want to apply? If you have applied, so that you can understand, I'm going to ask, uh, yes, I'm going to ask uh, the team to uh, mute microphones that are uh, unmuted accidentally. So if you are have not yet applied, the purpose of this briefing is for you to determine, do you wish to apply? There are strict deadlines uh, that uh, should be in this information briefing that we will uh, we will present to you. If you have applied, it is to give you a good sense of what you are getting into pending the decision by the Geneva Learning Foundation and partners on uh, whether or not you are selected for an upcoming cohort. And if you have been, in fact, already accepted and received your letter of acceptance for the 8th of October cohort, uh, this information briefing will fill in some of the blanks to give you the specific information that you need uh, to, uh, to fully understand what the program is about. So with that said, we're going to get going. So first of all, uh, this uh, program is funded by the EU's EU for Health program, and this is a collaboration between the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies with the Geneva Learning Foundation. And whether you are a health, education, social work professional, Red Cross staff, or volunteer, uh, this program is uh, is indeed uh, for you. And here we'll be showing, we'll be switching the slides uh, back and forth between English and Ukrainian. Some slides are bilingual, but we'll share the full slide deck with everyone afterwards. So uh, first of all, to clarify, who is this for? This program is really for anyone, no matter what the professional category, no matter what the job role, who is actually involved in supporting children by the humanitarian crisis in Ukraine. And this includes, but is not limited to, education, social work, health professionals. And one important um, uh, thing to specify is that this is not only for mental health professionals. In fact, uh, we'll, we'll, you will learn in the program how psychological first aid, or PFA, is a technique, an approach, a way of looking at a crisis situation, uh, and PFA for children. Children, specifically when that situation involves children, uh, that is really relevant for anyone that is likely to find themselves in that type of uh, situation. Now, um, where you can find more information is, of course, on the landing page. So presumably, if you are at this briefing, uh, you have already seen this page. It is available, of course, both in uh, English and Ukrainian. And there are additional languages coming online. So if you are, for example, uh, if you speak, if you are a Polish speaker, you'll be able to share this, uh, the information about the program with uh, fellow Polish speakers who do not speak either English or Ukrainian. So we have a lot to cover in today's briefing. I'm not going to go through all the agenda points, but just get ready. I'm going to go very quickly and share a lot of information uh, very quickly. And in fact, what I encourage you to do if I go too quickly is you can then go back. We'll make the recording available within a couple of days and you'll be able to, uh, to really uh, review at your own pace uh, the information that is here. So I first want to start with a question about what is peer learning. And the key point is that most significant learning that we use in our professional work, no matter what the job, doesn't uh, happen through formal training or formal education, but is acquired through experience. Uh, and that's a very, very important point. And so a, if we focus only on technical training, that means we're missing out that experiential component. And so this is why with the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies, we've launched this program with the first inaugural cohort now having been completed in June and July. Now, if you think about learning by experience, most of us can, can feel that how important it is. And it's always existed, but in the past, you were limited to your local connections, to people that, that are in your immediate environment. And of course, what changes is that digital technologies enable us to defy distance and boundaries and make connections with others. Having said that, there's a very important point that we also want to make, and that experience is not a substitute 
uh, for expertise. And I'd like to turn to Severine Jacomivite from uh, our team uh, to explain what that means. Um, and she is an expert on the subject. Uh, Severine? Yes, hello, Reda, and welcome, uh, everybody. Um, yeah, the, the, the point we want to emphasize here is that, uh, um, I mean, we will not turn you into experts. Maybe you are already an expert, a mental health uh, expert, for instance. Um, but with this course, we want you to, to learn by sharing experience uh, and, and that is really where, where the, the learning, uh, takes place. Uh, and even though, you know, if you, if you get the, the certificate from our course, uh, it will show that you have learned from this specific methodology, uh, but you, you will not be an expert in, uh, in mental health, but you'll be more able to provide PFA, uh, to, to children. Thanks, uh, thanks, Severine. And I see questions already coming into the Q and A. Um, we and I see, in fact, there is one raised hand. So I'm going to go to Borjana Dine. As we say, this is going to be very uh, interactive throughout the program. Today is kind of an exception, so don't be frustrated or disappointed if you do not get to share experience today in the way that you would like. Borjana Dine, warm welcome to you. Please introduce yourself. Tell us who you are and what you do, and what is your question or comment. Hello, I think that uh, I'm listening and uh, I'm listening to you. It's okay, my recording? Yes, yes we can hear you. It's okay. fine. Okay. Yes. Because I, I didn't see it. My name is Voriana Dina. I'm from Albania. I'm the child rights officer near the child rights center in Albania, also a psychologist. And uh, of course, I have uh, more than three years' experience in children's rights, in uh, uh, children that uh, are with trauma. And uh, I have been, uh, let's say, I have been uh, uh, been working with children that uh, has affected by sexual abuse or sexual exploitation. So has a lot of uh, experiences. And let's say experiences because a lot of it's not the, the, the good phrase. Uh, on that part and uh, in this file. So I don't know what else I need to 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 add, but I think that uh, the experience with the, the the children that are affected in uh, Ukraine is very harsh, and uh, it's for us is is hard to to know and uh, to learn and to read about that. And I can't imagine how the experience and uh, how the situation there is. So absolutely that for us, even for psychologists, but uh, even for all uh, professionals, it's a way that we need to help for what we have in our hands. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Now, uh, we do have a question from uh, Victoria no Nososvka. How long will the broadcast last? So we were scheduled for 60 minutes. We may go over if there are many uh, questions. Now, as I said, we have a lot to cover. Just for those of you who'd like to know more, because I know there are fellow educators in the room, for those of you who'd like to know more about the pedagogical approach that underpins uh, the Geneva Learning Foundation's model for really learning to action, uh, we can refer you to this uh, this paper. Um, I'm sure someone from our team will, will post the, uh, the link uh, to it, the reference to it, for those of you who are interested in that. Now, um, if we have alumni in the room, I'm going to lower all of the hands. Um, if we have alumni in the room, and I believe we do, who are here, uh, who kindly accepted the invitation to join the briefing because they are interested in what you as applicants, uh, potential applicants or selected participants are going to experience. So I'd like to ask you if you are an alum to raise your hand and uh, to really share what would you say is the most important thing for a new applicant, a new participant in the program to expect. And we have uh, Irina uh, Stefan, uh, first one with a, with a hand raised. Uh, please go ahead, Irina, I'm asking you to unmute, yes. Yeah, I think it works. I hope it works because something's really going on with my internet connection today, so hello. Um, well, I, I think, I don't know 
you hear me? Because yes. I hear just yeah, nothing. yeah, I was going to say, you. we hear you oh, loud okay. and clear. Uh, okay, that, that's good. So uh, I find this method, peer-to-peer -peer learning, like really, really mm, useful because you can find a lot of information on the internet yourself. You can read a lot of information about how to how to work with traumatized kids and whatever. But when you study from each other, when you see people working on the front line, like helping traumatized kids, this is absolutely different. And you see their emotions and you see how much of it, of their input they actually put into every child that comes to, um, to ask for help. And this is different because so you see how it works like soldier to soldier and here we are soldiers in some meaning yes because we are fighting for their psychological well-being and this is a different war and i'm happy that there are so many of us and not only ukrainians but also all around europe who are helping kids just to somehow survive this horrific period in their life thank you very much for everybody so, and I really appreciate that wonderful method. Yeah, thank you, Reda. So, Rina, you took, was it the English or Ukrainian language cohort that you participated in? Can you start by telling us that? Yeah, I participated in an English uh, language cohort just because yeah. I have to work with uh, my English-speaking colleagues as but I'm Ukrainian, actually. Okay. And that's a wonderful suggestion, actually. If we, we do accommodate really non-native English speakers, you will not be penalized because your English is not perfect. Uh, on the contrary, if you are bilingual, we would truly uh, and especially appreciate your uh, your participation. We also understand if you want, you really would would be you know disadvantaged by uh, if you're a Ukrainian speaker by going into the uh, the English uh, language cohort. Uh, Arena, you have of course a lot of expertise and experience in this area. What for you struck you or surprised you or really is memorable for you about what's special about uh, the uh, inaugural cohort that you participated in? What makes it different from other experiences that you have had? Well, actually, it makes different that here you see people from all around the psychological preparation levels. So it means like from volunteers who never heard anything about like they, they don't have any special education as psychologists to uh, psychotherapists and psychiatrists who are really well prepared. And I'm, um, I would say quite experienced in um, providing PFA. And you see the like from different perspectives you see the situations from different perspectives and the main thing you understand that no matter which level a person has the main thing is always readiness to be there love and compassion that everybody shows and this is the most important Thank you very much indeed, uh, Irina. It's a wonderful uh, testimonial. So uh, we'd now like to, Irina has shown you how uh, you know, to do the kind of sharing of experience that we'll be doing very much throughout the program. Uh, we would like now to ask you, okay, I see Ina Kovalenko. Uh, Ina, uh, please go ahead. We'd love to hear from you too. Um, uh, Ina Kovalenko, your hand was raised. Yes, do introduce yourself and, yes. and tell us you what you'd me. like to share. Uh -huh. Hello. Yes, we hear you loud and clear. There may be a delay before okay. you hear me. Please Fantastic. go ahead. Yeah, there is something with the signal, but um, thank you for inviting me as a, um, as a let's say, graduate, as an alumna. And uh, I want to say that I, I feel a lot of respect to all this program and this uh, pedagogical approach that the Geneva Learning Foundation has. And uh, I value the experience we had because there are no alternatives. I mean, in the real world, we cannot learn from, I don't know, 100, 200, 1,000 people who did something practical. And they take their field experience and they deliver it to us, to all of us as a group. And through this interpersonal and uh, intercollegial exchange, uh, we learn something that we cannot uh, read anywhere or just ask an instructor so this is something amazing right. thank you my thank you very much uh, ina kovalenko i'd like to because you are you you and uh, irina um not only uh, successfully 
participated in the inaugural cohorts, but also you were kind enough and took the care to join this information briefing today to share your experience. So as you know, in this program, we do something and I'd like to ask each of you uh, to do uh, alongside what you're going to hear, even if you're alone in front of your computer screen and your colleagues might look at you funny, uh, to go ahead and share uh, your applause for these two dedicated professionals who in addition to their daily duties supporting children uh, also took part in this peer learning program and even went a step further joining uh, today's uh, uh, today's briefing for the benefit of your colleagues who are now joining the next program they did not have to do this and they chose uh, to join and we're really grateful for that uh, Olga yes, Divino thank you Reda. And a very, very small comment also about extra steps that uh, TGLF is offering. For example, I know that Irina and I and some other peers were also additionally invited to, because we took part in the English speaking cohort, uh, to also contribute to the Ukrainian speaking one that was running a little bit later. And this was an extra level of uh, peer exchange. And uh, you said absolutely right, the, the language shouldn't be a barrier. And I'm very happy that I was in the English speaking cohort. I, I mean, I also had a reason to do it because I work with English speaking colleagues, but we were a little bit disadvantaged because for the majority of us, English is a second or a third foreign language. Uh, but uh, this doesn't in any way diminish the overall uh, high level quality of contact that we were uh, sharing with each other. So just, uh, I want to encourage everyone to really exchange even uh, if there are some some constraints, uh, maybe a language or anything else. Yes, I know that in Ukraine currently, I mean, it's electricity, whatever. So, um, but, but the people worked it out. I'm very proud of the people who did it from Ukraine, who found ways to overcome, you, you know, these uh, power shortages and many other things. Uh, so thank you again for uh, inviting us. And it's a lot of pleasure. And uh, again, a lot of respect to all of the people who made it possible. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, um, and and yes, and and uh, believe me, and we we will share this. It's true we don't have slides in this information briefing. It's unfortunate that we don't, but we did. We do have lessons learned and the, have adapted, adapted really the program to really fit the needs of the uh, challenges, including connectivity, including electricity outages. I think that that is something we should uh, update in the uh, next uh, revision to the briefing. Now, um, as you can see, if we ask you to share your experience, and for those of you who applied, you know we ask you many questions. And you could say, you could decline, you could say, no, I don't have anything to share. But many of you did share. And something remarkable came out of that sharing. And already, I'm very pleased uh, to announce that what we learned together from the inaugural cohort, the application process, will have another collection of insights, what we learned from the case studies. So this is about uh, sharing with you, even if you decided not to apply to the program, you could already um, use, uh, access, tap into the collective intelligence of the uh, uh, the, this this program of what practitioners have generated, and I'm going to share the two links for the uh, uh, English and Ukrainian version of something that we called experiences of uh, children, caregivers, and helpers. And this is 873 professionals from all over Europe who shared their experience, and you're now able to get uh, this uh, this collection, I can show you right now uh, the link to get it. This is the Ukrainian, but of course you can just click on English here and get the uh, uh, the link to the uh, Ukraine. Whoops, uh, to you. Okay, I see. There's actually a mistake here. Or actually, let me just make sure I'm on looking at the right page. Okay, I think we need to definitely have some lessons learned from uh, from this one. Uh, so yes, yeah, so if you go to the reports uh, landing page, you'll see you can just type in your name on an email and get the link to download this full report and really see what already even before for those of you who are new, even before you start the program, what you're able to uh, uh, to learn from fellow professionals. Uh, all right. So now again, if I could ask. Um, uh, Severine or Tatiana to mute individuals who uh, ha have uh, inadvertently uh, left their uh, microphones unmuted. Thank you. 
All right. So, um, a little bit of information about who's applied before we get to the practical details about the program, everything that you need to know in order to be able to, uh, to successfully uh, succeed in the program. That's the goal of the information briefing. So 1,007 applicants since the beginning, uh, 873 applicants. Um, Okay, but these two numbers seem to contradict each other. Uh, again, we'll fix that in the, uh, we'll have to revise the slide that can fix that. Uh, 371 participants were selected in the, uh, in, in the uh, inaugural cohorts, I believe this is, uh, and 141 um, professionals successfully completed the first, uh, this, this uh, the inaugural cohort. And together, this cohort generated 119 case studies, including ideas for projects that could help strengthen the support to uh, children affected by the humanitarian crisis in the in in Ukraine. So uh, we had this question already, um, and now we just like to take you through uh, one quote. I'm going to show because I am conscious of the time. We're already at minute 24, and we have not yet started giving you the critical information you, that you need to know uh, in order to be able to. One, if you haven't applied yet, make the decision, is this for me? Should I apply? Two, if you have applied, to understand really what you're getting into and to make sure that you fully understand what the requirements of this rigorous program will be. Uh, and three, if you have been accepted and selected and have confirmed your participation, we also invited you to this briefing to fill in some of the blanks and help you prepare uh, for the uh, uh, for the um, uh, for the cohort for this launch of the peer learning exercise on the 8th of October. So I'll just use this first quote. It warms my heart to see many people trying to make the world a better, more communicative and open place. What I would say to that is, what I would respond to that is, yes, there is definitely that warmth and that feeling of shared humanity and concern for children's well-being, but there's also very practical, tangible uh, sharing of experience that can help you in your professional work. The second, uh, uh, the second one here is I've learned that drawing the line between PFA and therapy can be difficult for psychologists. It's a common question and I'm not alone with it. Our group conversation made me think of ways to help preserve refugees' culture while helping with integration. So that seems to be a mix of uh, different issues and concerns. All right. You may be wondering who else is participating in this program. And that's really what we're going to look at in this next uh, section. So first of all, you can see that uh, 30% on the Anglophone side, for, so for English speakers, um, almost a third see themselves as members of the family. But you also have one in five that say, I don't know the Ukrainian community, but I am interested in supporting them. On the Ukrainian side, of course, you have almost four out of five who say they're members of family. Uh, and then a small proportion that says, you know, that they see themselves as a friend you can trust. Now, who are the children? You can see here uh, a lot of the sort of top three categories are very close. You know, 60, 58, 48 uh, percent. Children displaced outside of Ukraine is at the top of the list for the uh, Anglophones. And somewhat logically, uh, children displaced within Ukraine uh, are is at the top of the list uh, for the Ukrainian uh, speakers. Now, um, some, but not all of you, are Red Cross, um, uh, are Red Cross uh, staff or volunteers. Uh, and then many of you are volunteers, uh, but not in the Red Cross. And you can see this both on the Anglophone and uh, Ukrainian side. In terms of the organizations that are represented in the uh, applicants for the second cohort, you can see here that uh, on the left-hand side for Anglophones, more than half of you work in non-governmental organizations. And then we have smaller proportions of education organizations, private sector, United Nations, the government, and so on. And it's actually uh, what's interesting on the Ukrainian language side, Ukrainian speakers is 40% uh, NGOs, but then almost one in five work for education, so are likely to be uh, teachers or uh, working in education professions related to teaching and learning. Okay, I see there's some glitches here in the uh, display. Um, all right, on the Anglophone side, in terms of your professional roles, so primarily uh, mental health professionals in both uh, languages, but then you see social work, and then what's interesting on the English speaker side, you have humanitarian as the third category. Uh, here, 
with respect to gender, we have a cohort that's almost four out of five uh, uh, women in the Anglophone side and almost 100%, so 95.6% women on the Ukrainian uh, language side. So those are very interesting uh, gender proportions that uh, we'll seek to honor and make sure everyone is uh, included. Now, in terms of the countries that you work in, you can see, and this is really, um, we want to credit and appreciate the support of the uh, National Red Cross uh, societies that have supported the uh, to help us disseminate the announcement for this program and really share with professionals what is the opportunity. So in particular, from Romania, Ukraine, Poland, Hungary, Bulgaria for the Anglophones, and then Ukraine, Poland, Romania, uh, Moldova, Bulgaria, Germany, and Hungary. So you can see here uh, a lot um, a lot of the uh, interesting dynamics. We also want to credit the amazing networks of uh, non-governmental organizations. Again, there's some glitches here, which I can only apologize for, uh, for the uh, in terms of how this uh, displays. Um, now, as you know, this program is focused on psychological first aid, or PFA. And almost half of the applicants are trained in general psychological uh, first aid, but only a smaller, far smaller proportion have been trained in PFA for children. Now, the program is open to those who have no PFA experience. This does not disqualify you or prejudice you with respect to your application or the success of your application if you're still an applicant. Um, when we asked you, now this gets into more of the experiences that you uh, have begun to share through the application process. And you can see here uh, that your most difficult challenge on the Anglophone side is the impact of the humanitarian crisis on children. So that's at 21%. And on the Ukrainian language uh, speakers uh, are the constantly changing needs and circumstances. You can already see a difference here, even though these are close uh, percentages. And then your most important reason to apply so again, uh, on both sides, you have getting better at providing psychological first aid. I think there, there's just a glitch in the translation, uh, but the proportions are slightly different. So we'll be sharing the slide deck. And if you want to get some insights to know what to expect from your colleagues, how they are similar or different from you, this uh, is why we share this information. You, of course, are sitting alone in front of your computer screen. Um, and uh, this is all about making that human connection in order to share experience. So we wanted to give you a sense of uh, who you are um, as a group, as well as who you are as an individual. So I see a first question actually from Katerina Syriak, who says, my colleagues and me have applied for the program, but we haven't received any schedule for October. So um, one word of warning would be just to check your spam um, and uh, spam folders. In some cases, we have learners who uh, whose organizations filter out emails they do not know and they miss the letter of acceptance. So Katerina, I would urge you to check your spam or junk mail folder. Make sure that you whitelist emails from the Geneva uh, Learning Foundation. And thank you, Severine, for this, uh, who says October will be uh, the Ukrainian speaking cohort. So we have not yet announced the, uh, the next English speaking cohort. Just checking to see if there are uh, other uh, questions. Um, I don't see any uh, questions after I gave the link to the, uh, to the insights collection. So we wanted to clarify what are the sel selection criteria for the program so you understand um, before or after having applied. Of course, if you've already been selected, this can help you understand how come you were selected. Uh, but in any case, you know, we want to emphasize you do not need to be a specialist to be selected. And again, anyone with experience supporting the needs of children affected by the crisis is welcome to apply. And we encourage applications from you. Uh, and really, it's your willingness to share experience and to engage with others, your commitment to learning from each other, to share what you know, what you've learned, uh, and to listen and learn from the stories of others. That is what matters most in a peer learning program. So you can see here, the bold face is missing from these items where the things we wanted to highlight, we'll correct that in the slide deck as well. Now, uh, more let's say objective selection criteria are, uh, do you have direct experience supporting children? And do you have a commitment to actively engaging in peer learning? So a willingness to share your experience before we started this call, there are actually relatively few who uh, raised their hands or were willing to just introduce themselves. Uh, please know this information briefing is the only time that we'll be really limiting to 
presenting information. In this case, we do it this way because this is there's going to be critical information uh, that you need in order to make decisions about whether or not to apply, whether or not this program is for you, and if you've been accepted, to make sure that you fully understand what you're getting into. Now, we do have uh, shared commitments around child safeguarding, confidentiality and safety, professional duties and obligations, and in the application process, we ask you to confirm that you fully agree and commit to upholding those commitments. Now, this is more than compliance, it's about how we behave and who we are as a community and we'll be asking you because of the significant experience that you as highly qualified professionals and highly experienced professionals for so many of you will be asking you to help regulate this community to help us and and give feedback to your colleagues when you see something that is not consistent with these uh, with these principles in terms of the selection criteria we'll also be looking at balanced representation so geographic location professional role area of work your level of experience with with a PFA psychological first aid and psychosocial support language of course as well as gender um, so those are some of the additional uh, criteria. Now, uh, if you are not selected, because this is a selective uh, process, um, the Geneva Learning Foundation does not necessarily admit you simply because you apply. But we'll be looking at the criteria that I've just uh, that I've just described and looking, taking really a holistic view as we compose a cohort that we believe will lead to a successful, fruitful, productive, constructive uh, peer learning experience that can actually lead to improved uh, mental health outcomes for the children that you are supporting. So, if you're not selected, do not despair. Um, there will be additional cohorts. Your application may be prioritized for the next cohort. In some cases, the fact that you're not selected is not because there is something wrong with your application, but simply because of other considerations around diversity, around the, uh, the, the limitations we're placing on the current cohort sizes and so on. And you will still be considered a member of the community. You'll still be invited to uh, join the experience sharing public events. And we encourage you to check your email to make sure you, that you do not miss any of the significant opportunities that we'll be offering to everyone who expresses interest in the program, whether whether or not you have been selected uh, after following your application. So again, I'm going to mark a pause here. Uh, Severine has indicated and, and reminded everyone uh, that the application deadline for the English speaking cohort is the 30th of October and that letters of acceptance will be sent after that date. So going to mark a pause here. If you'd like to ask a question, there are two ways to do it. Uh, we recommend that you first use the, the, uh, the Q&A uh, to write your question there and then uh, raise your hand to speak if it's something that really uh, you'd like to introduce yourself. We really uh, enjoy that. Uh, yeah, so it's a little bit more uh, personal and a little less uh, anonymous because that is what peer learning is all about. All right, so I'm just going to mark a pause here, give you time to compose your thoughts. And Ksenia Sotska, we understand you have a bad internet connection. I saw a message earlier uh, about why we weren't seeing the speakers. This is out of respect for individuals who have connectivity problems. So Ksenia Sotska, I hope you're, you will also share the recording for that reason. Uh, so you'll be able to catch up uh, afterwards. And again, we're encouraging you to uh, use the uh, Q&A. Um, so Alona Capustina says, if I have already submitted a request once and was not selected, do I need to submit uh, an application again? Uh, in principle, no, but um, I would say send us a message so we can look at your application. If you're back uh, for this information briefing, it certainly demonstrates uh, a high level of interest from you. So it would be very important for us to, uh, to follow up. Uh, we'll share the, uh, if someone from the team can share the email uh, that Alona Capustina should send uh, her uh, her message to. All right, I think we're ready to go to the next uh, section. What will participants do? So you know, this is this program may be very different from the type of learning initiatives that uh, most of us experience online. In particular, very different from webinars. Um, Webinars in which there's an expert who presents on the topic, and then uh, that is considered to be a course. Um, all right, and there is indeed uh, um, a problem with the sound of the translation. Um, Lada, 
Uh, I hear you. I apologize again on behalf of the Geneva Learning Foundation for the uh, uh, the translation, the, the interpretation, the in issues with interpretation. This uh, briefing was planned a long time ago, so we'll be looking at that afterwards, and we'll we'll make sure uh, we'll do everything we can to make sure these issues do not happen again. We hope to get a good quality recording. So even if you have problems today, you should. Sit, we hope that you, either the the recording will be of sufficient quality to be able to use for the Ukrainian uh, version. Thank you. And uh, once again, apologies. Now, the requirements is you do need to be able to speak and write in either English or uh, Ukrainian. And then um, you will need to access TGLF platforms on a regular basis. Uh, there will be a specific platform for the peer review process. And you do need access to reliable internet connection. Now, um, you know, so those are the hardcore technical requirements, but there's a lot of flexibility within that. So first of all, there's a couple of, there's a few sort of key messages uh, that I'd like to share with you that are actually quite important. Um, so, yeah. so, first of all, this program is really designed for busy professionals. And the first thing we would like you to understand and to convey to you is we know that you are short on time. Whether or not you work in an emergency crisis context, we know that there is this is a humanitarian context. We know that time is the most precious resource. Everything that we do in this program is focused on helping you share experience and learn from colleagues in ways that are going to help you better support children. Nothing we do, at least the goal, is that everything, we do not waste your time, we do not ask you to do formal activities if they do not actually help you improve the quality of the work that you're doing to support children. So most tasks can be done at any time, and usually most tasks can be done offline, even when you have, if you have lost connectivity for whatever reason. But there are hard deadlines and there is no uh, no way to ask a request for an extension to those deadlines. And this is for a very simple reason, because this is peer learning. And in peer learning, you are going to be dependent on each other. There will be individuals who are dependent on you, and you will depend on them. And you will not be able to progress or complete the program if you do not complete uh, your work on time, or, and this is the key to peer learning, or if someone else that you are dependent on does not complete their work or misses the deadline. So this is why we're unable to, um, to offer extensions. Now, what you'll actually do is meet and share experience with fellow participants in live peer learning and peer support sessions. What you will actually do is develop, you have to write up a short case study about a specific situation in which you help a child or a group of children in distress. What you will actually do is then help three colleagues, give them feedback through the peer review process to improve their own case studies. And you can see the time allocation for each of these steps. And then finally, once you have received feedback from, your, from three of your colleagues who've looked at your case study, you'll revisit your experience and revise your own uh, case study. So those are some of the activities. The uh, time estimates are, are really indicative and maybe very different from one individual or another but this is i think in most cases uh, fairly consistent from what you have found now if you miss a live session for whatever reason you'll be able to watch the recording so that's how we respond to that concern if you cannot connect for whatever reason you'll be able to get the link for the recording you'll be able to, you should then focus on your project offline you do need a laptop so uh, you do need electricity uh, or a good uh, battery a generator and then you'll need to make arrangements to submit your project online and perform peer review so internet is required for those two last tasks and those are required for certification. We'll get into the certification requirements in a little bit. So I'm again going to mark a pause. We're at the 42 minute mark. You'll see that we pride ourselves uh, keeping on time. Uh, let me just see, there is a, a question from Lilia Zuza. Um, okay, and I see that's actually responding to a question. All right, thank you. 
Um, so are there additional questions? Let me check. So please raise your hand or use the Q&A function to ask your questions. If uh, from our team you've spotted questions that uh, would be good to answer now, please let me know. Otherwise, we'll go to the next section. So key requirements for certification. The Geneva Learning Foundation does not uh, certify attendance. Simply being there is necessary but not sufficient uh, to, to earn certification. Uh, because our certification is based on two things. It's based on competency, so the demonstration of the behaviors that are, will make a difference and improvement in those behaviors. And the way we know whether competencies are being developed is by assessing a project that you develop. In this particular program, the project is a case study. In other programs, it may be something else. But in every program, what we certify is what you that you have actually developed a project and gone through the peer review process. Now we also look at attendance records. Someone who never attends but submits a project will probably is unlikely to complete the program. But someone who attends everything but actually does not do a project will not receive certification. We do not uh, uh, certify uh, uh, only attendance. Now if you are new to um, to psychological first aid. We have a very strong recommendation um, that to complete a 20 minute rapid e-learning module before you start. And then we'll be sharing a number of PFA resources uh, that, can, that can help you. And of course, even though our purpose is not to develop your technical skills, that is not what we're after in this program um, directly. By connecting with Experience PFA for Children Practitioners, you are very likely to improve those skills as well. But the main focus is on enabling you to share your experience and to learn to improve your practice by doing so. Now, here are some screenshots of the Psychological First Aid in Support of Children e-learning module. This is a very basic and rapid introduction. Uh, there should not be the illusion that in 20 minutes you are going to be become an expert, as uh, Severine said. Uh, so, just... Uh, so that is also very important. So now, some guidelines is that you'll need to submit your project on time. You'll need to peer review the project of three colleagues on time. And again, this is because they depend on you. They will not be able to successfully complete the program if you do not do your peer reviews on time. And you will not be able to progress or complete the program if your colleagues do not honor their reciprocal commitment. So that is really key. And then the same, you'll, when you revisit your experience, you, get, you receive feedback from your colleagues and you revise your own project using peer review feedback, that also needs to be done uh, on time. So we're going to mark a pause here now and turn to you uh, to experience uh, what we mean by sharing of experience. Uh, we'd like to have lowered all the hands and asking you, uh, asking we need at least one volunteer who is willing to share one experience that you think you would like to write up as a case study. So something, a situation in which you were confronted with a child uh, in crisis or children in crisis, um, and where you tried to provide support to that child or those children and what uh, came out of that. If you could tell us, could just, this is simply about sharing your story. You do not need to be an expert. To have had to have experienced a situation like that, of course, if you are qualified and particular mental health expert, then we welcome your testimonial as well. But uh, whatever your job role, we'd love to hear from you. And first of all, you'll have to raise your hand. As you can see, I've just raised my hand, so you should look for the button in Zoom to do so. And please uh, do not be shy. We know we have seen with uh, uh, Ukrainian and English-speaking cohorts. Actually, it takes a little bit of time before somebody finds the courage and we recognize it's not easy uh, to um, uh, to be able to uh, to be able to step up like that so we do need at least one volunteer this is peer learning if you're here for this program you made the effort to attend this information briefing we you appreciate your effort but you know if 
you are not able or willing to share your experience in this information briefing, it is unlikely that you would be able to, uh, to participate in the peer learning program itself. So I really want to encourage all of those of you who are here to raise your hands. And I know it can be difficult, especially in a room of uh, strangers. Uh, so now please go ahead. And I believe- uh, Rene, there's a raised hand. Yes, indeed, Irina Haberstro. Uh, please, Irina, uh, we'd love to hear from you. Don't forget to introduce yourself. And can you think, can you tell us about one experience uh, that you'd like to uh, potentially write up as a case study? Hello, everyone. I an NGO, and from the first place, I lived in Odessa, and I helped disabled children with disabilities. Uh, that was something I did before the war. We saw children who came with their parents, who were very lost. Uh, they were in shock. So we just we to get together with them, play live music, uh, to drown out the sound of the missiles. We began to do breathing exercises and uh, do some practical therapy when we involve parents able children to we read stories, stories to children, so fairy tale therapy. What happens? How things happen? How things happen? And we said that we need ribbons for soldiers. And um, so we did various things, we occupied them. And a month later, after the kind of work, we also did some dancing, some play, and we talked about the situation. So later, there was less and less stress. And currently, I can say that the children who have been with us from first days or in Odessa uh, have adapted well, smile. Yes, sometimes we have a lot of shelling, explosions. Children come to us for help. Fairy tale therapy is very effective. It helps improve the spirits. The children tell these fairy tales to their parents to calm down. And uh, I've heard cases uh, that I would like to share. And uh, we also do trips to the botanical gardens, talk to trees. We help restore um, nature together with the children. So I can see that it works, I think. Thank you uh, very much indeed for this very powerful uh, uh, and, and compelling uh, testimonial, Irina Haberstro. Really appreciate it. Uh, we'd like to offer you a round of applause for the support that you provided under the circumstances you described. We'll be looking, of course, in this uh, in the uh, peer learning exercise at the specific ways in which psychological first aid uh, can be uh, can be useful in such contexts, but also not disregarding, really looking at the whole environment, looking at all of the activities that are helpful in such uh, contexts. Uh, let me see, there is Olga Divanok. 
who's also uh, got her hand raised, Olga Divinok. Um, yes, we'd love to hear from you as well. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Olga Divinok, and I work as an MHPSS officer in Save the Children, uh, namely in Dnipro. Uh, this is uh, the eastern part of Ukraine, and uh, that's why we have... Uh, a lot of uh, situations uh, when we need to use uh, this uh, uh, psychological first aid. And for me, psychological first aid is um, the situations uh, when we have to react rather quickly after a stressful event. Uh, for me, this is not a therapy or something like this. Uh, this is just really psychological first aid. And uh, now uh, when thinking about my uh, one of the situations, uh, I uh, remember a situation when there was an explosion. The sirens went on and there was explosion in the city. Uh, it was not rather close, but I decided to go to the underground parking. And uh, there were some um, people, some persons there already. And among them, I saw a mother with a child. Um, I don't know, the child was approximately five or six years old, something like this. And um, I saw that this child was uh, scared because, you know, explosions uh, can be rather loud. Uh, that's why I approached this family and uh, started uh, speaking to this child and his mother. And uh, what I did first, I was speaking in a gentle, in a calm voice, uh, rather slow, you know, just I used my voice uh, to calm this uh, child. Uh, then. Uh, the child started explaining what scared him. Uh, and um, <clears throat> after this, um, uh, I just proposed to, to do some breathing exercises to calm this child even more. Uh, after breathing exercises, I saw that this really helped. And uh, I proposed to just to walk around this uh, underground parking just to see what is going on here, what is there, you know, a kind of grounding, something like this. And we were just walking very slowly with him and his mother and uh, uh, speaking in a calm, slow voice. And uh, after some minutes, I saw that uh, this helped. And uh, uh, of course, the child was a bit scared, but this helped and uh, he felt more confident. Uh, more safe. So this is a kind of experience I had with the psychological first aid. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Olga Divinok, for sharing. We're looking at, for those of you who are less familiar with the psychological first aid, of course, we'll be supporting you uh, through that process and providing access to technical guidance and resources. But uh, thank you for those two testimonials. Again, the main purpose today is really to answer your questions and to provide what we know is the critical information you need to make decisions if you have not to apply, if you have not applied yet, uh, if you have applied to understand what you're getting yourself into, and if you have been selected and accepted into the program to give you a sense of who we are as a group, as a community, and also what to expect uh, to be doing during the, uh, uh, the peer learning exercise itself. So uh, we're looking at, finally, uh, in this final part of the briefing, and I realize uh, we're running late, we're four, we've got four minutes left, uh, so I'm going to tell you very quickly what to expect from the peer learning exercise timeline and structure. So first of all, the key dates for applicants uh, you can see here. So the closing deadline for English is the 30th of October, and for the, the closing deadline for the next uh, Ukrainian cohort is the 30th of September. Um, and then you can see the dates. We have a second cohort, which is closed for applications, but which will be starting on the 8th of October. We appreciate the participation of those of you who uh, joined the information briefing today following the receipt of your letter of acceptance. This may be less useful for you than for others uh, who are applicants or potential applicants, but the uh, the, the the activities, uh, the certification will begin on the 8th of October. And then we already have a third Ukrainian language cohort plan. We do want to share our 
our appreciation and really recognition for the Ukrainian language uh, practitioners who have uh, joined uh, and trusted us uh, to join this program, uh, joined, participated, distinguished themselves through their performance, and they're now, uh, this is now leading to two more uh, cohorts. Then we do have a, a second English cohort scheduled as well. And that's uh, in, the, we're trying to reach, again, professionals working across the uh, uh, the European Union. So there may be, there are definitely some more challenges there with respect to uh, to languages spoken by professionals at the local levels as we're seeking to really engage uh, professionals who directly interact with uh, children affected by the uh, humanitarian crisis in Ukraine. I'm keeping an eye for questions, but also conscious of the time. There's only a few um a few more uh, bits of information to share. So uh, all of you are, were invited as individuals, but of course you have um, employers or you, some of you may be volunteers and we also want to recognize and honor that, um, whether or not, you know, as volunteers for the Red Cross or volunteers for non-governmental or other types of organizations. So um, if you, you believe that this program could help not just you as an indi individual, but also uh, you, uh, your organization, um, we encourage you to contact our team to discuss how you can become a partner. And in fact, some of you will be receiving an invitation to join a briefing focused on how your organization can become a partner of the certificate program and how your staff uh, and volunteers can benefit. So just to say beyond the, um, the peer learning cohort, the peer learning exercise that really um, is, is the step one of the program, we do have a range of activities that we'll be announcing uh, very soon, really helping not just uh, become better at um, providing psychological first aid and supporting children, but also actually focused on how to take the, um, uh, the experience that you have and use that to turn it into a project that you can implement in your organization. This is what we call the full learning cycle approach. Approach, and it's a series of activities and the peer learning exercise is only step one. Uh, now, we do have uh, a final spot for Q&A and uh, Tatiana, thank you for uh, letting me know that um, uh, Oksana, uh, is it uh, Nazarenko, uh, has uh, an experience that she would like to share. Oksana, of course, uh, if you are participating in cohort two or if you have applied and are selected by the Geneva um, Learning Foundation. Yes, thank you. Can you. Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Please go ahead. What would you like to share? Hello, everyone. I want to And at the beginning, I worked a lot with teenagers and young people. And now, I want to share uh, about something that happened months ago. With, I worked with a girl, uh, with a 10-year-old girl, back in Germany with her mother and sister, but her emotional was very um, aggressive. Uh, the girl didn't understand what was happening. So she came to me for help. And I wanted to say that, yes, she was 10 years old. But I'm trained to work um, uh, with emotions to, um, as a therapist. So I can um, I could talk to her about anger, sadness, aggression, joy, and other emotions, and how you can react safely through drawing. I also worked. I, I taught her to work with her body. Children must feel their bodies, and it helps them better respond. And through their drawings, we were able to. I was able to teach her self-care. 
So it is important for children to understand their own emotions and uh, to express themselves better and later make decisions on how to communicate at home with, um, with her mother and her sister, how to do this safely. And it was pleasant for me that um, uh, both the girl and her, and her mother uh, said it's such a nice situation now. Even my sister began to play with me, she said. And even the situation at school and in the city became better. She started communicating with other children, and that's important. When a child has a stable emotional um, environment. So that was my experience. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Oksana, for sharing. Um, thank you for, we heard three voices today, but there's so many more of you who are in the room and we know and value uh, the experience that each of you can bring to this program. We also commit to giving back and sharing with you uh, what you share together. Uh, with your consent, of course, you choose what you share and, and uh, who it will be shared with. We want to be crystal clear about that, but again, uh, you can go right now to see what 873 previous applicants shared in the application process and really get a feel for a wide range of experiences, challenges, uh, success stories, lessons learned around the experiences of children, caregivers, and helpers. And this is available today both in, uh, in, uh, in English as well as in Ukrainian. Now, um, Thank you very much for attending this briefing. We're always available to follow up uh, should you have any further questions. Uh, we also encourage you, if, you're, if you haven't done so already, to follow uh, the Geneva Learning Foundation on social media. Of course, a lot of our content is related to other countries and geographic regions, particularly focused on Africa. But you will see, well, you will be seeing in the coming days and weeks uh, more content focused on uh, on Ukraine and specifically uh, support uh, to children affected by the humanitarian crisis in Ukraine. So that's it for today. Thank you so much uh, for having taken the patience and the care to attend this meeting, uh, for, especially for those of you who uh, sh were able to share their experience today. Encourage you to do so, and thank you. And we hope to see you very soon. So many messages coming in we won't be able to share them all but we do want to share uh, a thank you for joining and for for uh, helping us bring this program to life you and your experience are what is bringing this program to life thank you